Hey, I'm Joel. Uh, I'm in my home territory of West Sussex in the UK. I'm going for a run and you're coming with me. Let's go. Today I'm running with Charlie Bauer. Morning. Morning Charlie. Thanks for coming. And Badger. Probably won't see much of Badger while we're running. So Charlie's been... Uh, on an interesting journey this year and years before, Charlie's what I call a archetypal hardest, somebody who really embraces difficulty and challenge in their training and their running. What have you been up to this year, Charlie? This year I've been competing to um, run the most miles of anyone in the Tough Mudder competitive series, which consists of three different types of races. You've got Tougher Mudder, which is a Tough Mudder course, but it's time. Um, you have Toughest Mudder, which is an eight-hour Tough Mudder course, starting from midnight until eight in the morning. And then you've got the World's Toughest Mudder, which is a 24-hour non-stop um, course in Atlanta. You um, did that last year, right? Yeah. In, in, it was yeah. Vegas last year. Yeah, last year over in Vegas. Um, so different conditions. I mean, this year it ended up being, well, it was horrendous by the end of it. Um, I saw the photos. <laughs> It looked I mean, colder than it was this morning. A lot colder. We expected it to get to about one degree. And then once we actually got out there and started racing, it got to about minus four. So, I mean, your hands were getting stuck to obstacles. Oh. Um, so how many obstacles are on a loop? <coughs> yeah. So you've got um, five, uh, the toughest and the world's toughest. A uh, five mile loop with 20 to 26 obstacles per loop. And you just keep going and keep going. How many loops do you need? Uh, this year I got uh, 11, oh. so 55 miles. Oh my! <laughs> but um, but it meant meant that I won the whole um, series with 400 miles. So last oh, year's winner, cool. Cool. last year's winner got uh, 335. So 400 is quite a 400 miles in a year. That's quite you, pleasing. That. That's amazing, Charlie. And how many how many obstacles do you think that is? Uh, I tried working it out. Um, I don't know. It's a lot. That's incredible. 1500 to 2000. So where have you been on the Tough Mudder um, series worldwide? This year, um, where did I go to? Uh, LA, but that got cancelled. Texas. Well, you went there anyway. Yeah, we cancelled the day before. Um, Texas, Michigan, uh, England, Australia, Germany, twice. That's it, Germany twice? Yeah, San Francisco, Chicago and Atlanta. That is just incredible. And, and a few other races around the country as well. So... Prior to this year, how many obstacle course races have you done? Um, I think probably 13, I think, maybe 15. Right. Um, so I kind of, I've only been doing it for like three years, I'd say. Um, and then before that, the year before, I did a few marathons and things. Have you always been into running? Um, yeah, not to this level, but enough to, I mean, to enjoy it, you know, five to ten mile runs. Um, but then... I signed up for the 24-hour race because it just sounded great, and then once I realised the training involved, that just sort of put me up, um, you know, to, to another level. Well, you used to be a, you used to be, you're an architect now, but you used to be a professional athlete, right? Before yeah. Yeah. Your I, used play, I used to play polo as well. Horse, that's horse polo. Yeah. So when I was, um, I don't know, about um, 16, I'd say, 17 played for about six or seven years and the same with that it was morning <laughs> um, the dog was everywhere <laughs> um, travelling all over the world playing that so Argentina, New Zealand, Australia um, Spain, Dubai and how much physical training was involved in the preparation for that sport? Um, was it just horse training? Um, yeah I mean really I mean you're riding every day you're riding anything between like 10 and 20 horses a day. Really? So, you know, you keep pretty fit doing that. But running wasn't part of your schedule at the time? No, no, no. No, I mean, you really didn't have time to fit it in. So, what was the, what was the motivation to start running? Um, oh, oh, to be honest, I mean, my friend was um, signed up to do the London Marathon. And, um, he hadn't done any training, so around about January, the marathon was in April, 
So in January he asked if I wanted to do it instead of him. So oh, he gave you a ticket. He gave you his ticket. Yeah, so I think you could get a charity money. So I went away, got a training program, got all excited. And when I saw him next, you know, all excited about hugs and shoes and this and that. And then he decided that he wanted to continue running it. Oh. So I thought, well, I'll keep training. I'll jump the fence at the start line and just <laughs> see what happens. And then a week before, um, another friend said that he couldn't run because oh. he was injured and gave me his place. And um, when I picked up his number, he said, oh, I forgot to tell you, I'm an elite runner. I said, oh, that's fine, that's fine. He said, no, no, you're going to start with the Kenyans. Oh, no way. Yeah, so I was like, oh. <laughs> So I've done like, I don't know, seven weeks training and then I ended up starting on the front line with the Kenyans. <laughs> so, and it was Paula Radcliffe. your first marathon. Yeah, and it was Paula Radcliffe's last marathon as well. Oh my goodness. So she came out to a little, you know, goodbye speech and ends up standing next to me on the start line. <laughs> so everyone at home is watching TV. And there's little you on there. The... Yeah. Um, and that whole experience was such a buzz. You know, the whole, the whole day, everything. And that kind of really what started me off. So, so how much training did you do for your first the marathon. elite marathon? Uh, I mean, literally like six, six, seven weeks. Yeah. I was just running as far as I could each time. Do you so think like, your uh, your background as a professional sportsman helps with your um, attitude? Or yeah, your... I, think, I think with the attitude it does. Because you know you have to do the training if you want to get anywhere. Yeah. And each day that you say, oh, I can't do this... It's just a day with a step backwards. So, so well, after London, yeah, you did a couple of well, after funky London, marathons, didn't you? Well, so after London, I because um, it was quite a downer afterwards. Um, you know, I wanted something which was where I found tough mudder. So, but I signed up for one um, which was like five months ahead. So I trained my ass off, got to race day. And it was almost like I'd overtrained. Right. So but I still loved the whole race. And then I went home. I just looked for the hardest one you could put behind, which is where I found the 24 hour race. That's amazing. Yeah. Didn't you do the uh, Great Wall of China? Yeah, yeah. So when I was leading up to the 24 hour race first year, I thought by training I'd do um, some like, interesting marathons. So I did Paris, ran over the Great Wall of China. Um, absolutely. Yeah, to London again. Um, God. Yeah, What's well, the uh, Great Wall of China Marathon? Oh, I mean, it's horrendous. <laughs> I mean, you, you don't go for a PB there. You just... Um, go to finish? Know, yeah, you just... I mean, there was guys I've spoken to who done about 40 marathons, and their goal was just to finish it. Really? Yeah. It's uh, quite steep in places, isn't it? That's awful. I mean, this, you know, it's steps everywhere. And then, um, but they're not, they're all uneven. So, you know, you're running up a step and then you've got, you know, then you miss a step and, you know, when you're exhausted and the heat. So, yeah. So that was good training for the obstacle course series? Uh, no, because it, it, it destroyed my knees. Oh. So I was out for three weeks. Oh my God. Yeah. But, I mean, mentally it's good training. You know, because it just means, you know, you've just got that grit to see it through to the end. So how much of it, I want to come back to talk about the obstacle course racing specifically, but how much of it is mental and how much of it is I'd say physical? 70-80% mental. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, you know, especially a 24-hour race, after five or six hours, you know, everything starts dropping, you know, your grip strength, your energy levels, I mean, you can keep your know, nutrition rate. Right. But then, at that point, the sun sets, so everything gets a lot slower. And then, you know, three, four hours later, and people start dropping off the course, and you're all on your own, out running, knowing you've got another 12 hours to go. You know, it's hard. That's incredible. Well, I really admire that. Yeah. I admire anybody that does anything that's extremely difficult, just for the sake of it. Yeah. Let's uh, run around this way. Not a very interesting run this morning, Charlie. Sorry. No, no, that's good. I, I mean, I say this is the first run I've done since since I did well. Yeah. So, well, yeah. Welcome back to it. The um, the training you did for this series because that's a hell of a lot of mileage. Yeah. Four hundred miles. Yeah, that's right. In one year, plus all the obstacles. Uh -huh. How much were you doing on a weekly basis? Um, 
as much as I can, but because I was doing so many races over the summer, you know, I've been going, I did, um, one weekend I was in Texas for an eight hour, but I would course, the other thing, I'd run this eight hour race midnight late in the morning on Saturday, but on the Saturday morning I'd also run another tougher race. <laughs> and how long is the tougher race? About 10 miles, so, but I do that on uh, consecutive weekends, I did Texas, England and Australia. That's a run in the morning, a run overnight, and then a run for the following morning. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah run Saturday morning, and then the eight hour race, and then the Sunday on the plane back home. That's incredible. Uh, <coughs> so what sort of distances were you running in, back um, here in the UK? Um, I, tried, I tried not to go over 12 miles, just because then I could train the next day. Yeah. If I was doing like... I know all about next yeah, day running. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's, it's planning it. So, if I did do a 20 mile run, then I'd have two rest days afterwards or something. Gotcha. So, uh, and know, how much how much training were you doing off your feet, like gym training, strength uh, training? Again, as much, it, it depends on my races. This year my training's revolved all around races, so, you know, on a normal week I try and get in there twice. Um, stretching, core strength. Um, and then, you know, with the runs in between, but I was trying to more get the um, uh, rest days in as well, because I didn't do that last year. Right. And yoga's quite an important part yeah, of your yeah. training. Yeah, But yoga has been amazing. So. And how's your diet? Because when we first ran, you were, we were stopping every few miles to yeah. consume calories. Yeah. And you've gone all keto right yeah, now. Yeah, keto. I mean... How's that working out for you? Incredible. Way better than I thought. Yeah. It's fully into keto, and come the race day, uh, in 24 hours, I had no problems whatsoever. Really? Yeah, I, I mean, I think I consumed solid food, a bagel, and that was it. Really? And the rest of it was just, you know, burning fat. I mean, obviously I had some gels that helped with amino acids and things, and a product called Vespa Power, which, you know, kickstarts your body to burning fat. But, but you're pretty well adapted, because you've yeah, been doing it, it for a long time. Yeah, I think that's a hard thing. You know, it takes a few months to get adapted. And you've got to do it properly. So be quite strict on everything. Yes. I mean, you, you know, every breakfast, lunch and dinner was always monitored and revolved around keto. So I'm guessing your social life the past year hasn't been there. Uh... What? what, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no social life whatsoever. Let's run to the bridge and then we'll turn around. That will be about my three mile minimum today. Yeah. Incidentally, it's today 2,884 for me. Wow. <laughs> that's crazy. See, I, that sounds more crazy than the runs I did. Yeah. Right. Ah, oh, back we go. Let's come on this side of each other so people can hear what you're saying. So, as I remember, and I sponsored you a little bit. <laughs> yeah, which is very kind, thank you. Um, you were the objective of trying to do as many miles in one year and as many Tough Mudders as you can Yeah. just to try and raise the prize money for doing so from the Tough Mudder company yeah. for your charity of choice which yeah. I believe is a, yeah, so close to your heart, right? Yeah, a friend of mine, James Wimler Stanley um, took his own life about 10, 12 years ago so his parents have a, a charity in his name which they've just opened a centre in Liverpool, James's place so the... <coughs> Excuse me, I've got a cold. Yeah. Um, the, yeah, so the prize money of 10 grand was going to go 10, five, 8 grand towards my expenses. It must have been considerable as well. Yeah. I mean, no, I mean, it cost me over 10 grand just to do the races, but then, and then I was going to give 2 grand to the charity. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. So what happened to that? They decided to take it away. So? So I was literally, I finished the race with nothing. So the 100 million... Dollar Tough Mudder Corporation. Yeah. Just was going to give a prize for the most number of miles run in a year. Yeah. And he did 400, which he's unheard of. Yeah. Beating the world champion. Beating okay. the world champion. And then they decided not to do nothing. Give prize money after all. No. That's incredibly shit. It's, I mean, it's soul destroying. If you're honest. Well, we'll do our part. I'll put a donate now button on this. Oh, thank you. Thanks. That'd be amazing. Um, YouTube channel, so any money you want to donate, we'll go to the James James Wentworth Stanley Memorial Fund. James Wentworth Stanley Memorial. I mean, Memorial. if you look up 
James's place, you'll see what it's all about on there. Well, mental health is very much in the news these days, and yeah, yeah. it's That's been a, a long time thing. coming. You know, and doing these races for the charity, the amount of people that have stopped me and had chats with me, I mean, it is crazy. So many people have been affected by it. Yes, well, it's one of those things that rarely gets talked about. Yeah, you know, I mean, it felt like because I, you know, had experience gone through things, people felt comfortable talking to me. Of course. And so... It's a terrible thing we have to go through. Yeah. But, uh, his parents yeah. must be extremely glad of your support. Yeah, I think so. What little money we can raise. Every penny counts, though. Well, do what you can. Uh, so, uh, dare I ask, what's uh, the next big, hardest challenge okay. you're going to... Well, it depends. Take on I mean, time. I'm waiting to see what Tough Mudder's response is going to be to me winning this thing. Yeah. You know, if they if they honour their promise of paying me you know, the price money. It's a test. We're only talking ten thousand pounds, right? Yeah, but I mean, that's the difference between me racing or not. Yeah. So if they honour that, then you know, I'd like to do something similar again next year because the eight-hour races are being becoming twelve-hour races. They've changed that setup, so. You know, it'd be good to do, but if they don't, I mean, I'm just going to have to be really selective of what races I run. Cool. So, uh, well, presumably, now you've got all this amazing conditioning and fitness and strength, and something of a reputation, of course, you'll want to keep doing obstacle course yeah, races. Yeah, well, the thing I'd love to, but if I can't afford it... Have you ever tried the Spartan series? Yeah, I've done some Spartans. They're, um, I mean, Spartans are great. They're just a different setup of races. Yeah. So Tough Mud is a lot more about everyone getting in together and helping each other out. Yeah. Um, which Spartans is every man for himself. Yeah, right? yeah. Which is, yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just different. Yeah. So tell me, tell us about the toughest mudder. I'm intrigued by that. The toughest. I saw the, yeah, I saw the photograph. Yeah. And it looks super cold. And you were wearing yeah. a. I mean, it's like, I mean, I think when you've got conditions like this, you can put on your gear, you've got it, temperature gets up, you're fine. Go on. But the world's toughest when that got down to minus four. Minus four? Yeah, I mean. It knocked everyone for sex. You know, you had some of the elite guys who were just, you know, coming up with hypothermia. Um, someone took their bib off, the racing bib, when they went to their tent, came out and it's frozen solid. Oh, no way. So, so yeah, it's, I mean, it's hard, really hard. But then that's where mentally you've really got to stick it out. Yeah, that's where it becomes it. Yeah. 100% mental, I'm guessing. Yeah. And what, I can't imagine the thought process is going through your head when you're in a relatively warm tent with yeah, a warm well, drink I mean, and you've, you've got to put all that down. Yeah, I mean, I changed because I was getting so cold. I changed into a dry wetsuit about four in the morning. Right. That was so hard because you take everything off, dry yourself up, put some warm clothes on for five, ten minutes, then just put your wetsuit on and, you know, you could easily stop. I bet. But, and also when everyone around you is stopping as well. So, that must be... You know, people Extremely are in the tents hard. having coffees, blankets around them, and you're getting changed to go back out. Hardcore, Charlie. Much respect. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was brutal. I'm not sure I can do it. I'm a <laughs> small amount everyday I'm sure guy. Good. I'm sure you could. And so, what were the obstacles like? I saw a yeah, the, crazy um, jump. Yeah, so they had one called the Stacks. So you climb up, I think it was like 38 feet. And it's like shipping containers. Yeah. Right? And then you jump into water. That sounds insane. Um, but all, every obstacle there, no matter how easy it is on the first lap, becomes awful at the end. Oh, yeah. I can imagine. Um, I really admire the, what the Tough Mudder guys and the Spartan guys have done. Yeah. Obstacle course racing seems. Yeah. Do you know what? I mean, doing all these races over the year, the interesting thing is seeing how each race that they set up with different obstacles, different terrain, have a similar difficulty. So I don't know whether they've got some equation of working out how... Um, an obstacle and a terrain affects the race. Right. But yeah, I mean, there was... It was pretty well balanced. Yeah, really well. I mean, you know, and you had... Of the seven, eight-hour races I did, each had completely different conditions, but a similar difficulty level. What was your favourite one, do you think? If you look, looking back, what was the one um, you think, oh, I enjoyed that? Well, San Francisco was the only one, was the first one they did during the day. Right. Which was great. But the difference with that was, because it was during the day, no one was rushing to get home after the race. Right. So, so when I say during the day, it was from um, 8 in the morning until 4. Um, so after the race was like, you know, it's like a, 
party. Yeah, yeah, everyone just sat around relaxing in the sunshine. Was it in the city itself? No, it's up in the hills. So just out on the outskirts. Right. So yeah, a lot of hills. Hey, yeah. San Francisco is known for its hills. I've run yeah. many of them many times. Yeah. So what was the worst obstacle, do you think? Um, this year? Worst, it sounds crazy, but at World's Toughest there was one called Lumberjack, which was literally um, a big pole right. about that high level. Yeah. You had to climb over. Yeah. And there's six of them in a row. Oh. But it's at that height where it's too high to oh, yeah. jump over. And when it's wet, slippery and frozen, oh. I mean... It's just so hard. And you have to go over them, you can't yeah, go around. Yeah, you have to. Are there forfeits for not doing if you it? Well, that one's a must complete, so if you don't do it, you're disqualified. So. And you did that how many times? 11? Yeah. I mean, one of my friends did it, slipped off, banged his back on the third lap, and he was out of the race. Oh, my God. So, and a lot of people injured themselves with it. So, what's the uh, camaraderie like amongst the Us, fairly elite level OCR guys? Elite. I mean... Because you're elite, or do you no, not count yourself as such? No, I mean... I think the elite guys are the ones, you know, on the podium. Right. Um, but, no, but even those guys will help anyone out. You know, it's, it's always a done thing. You complete an obstacle and you'll help a couple of people up. Yeah. Which is, you know, That's nice. great. Badger. Badger, wait. Wait, go road. Good job. I'm uh, astonished they didn't even acknowledge your... Nothing. Didn't even mention my name or anything. 400 miles. Yeah. The ultimate... As an amateur as well. Yeah. yeah. The ultimate loyalty mm. to an uh, organisation and to a race series. Yeah, yeah. And they didn't even mention your name. No, no. That's uh, so, embarrassing. I'm hoping they'll reconsider. I hope they will. I'm sure they will. They're yeah. not bad people. It's a good company from what I've read. Yeah, I mean, they are. I mean, I guess it's such a big company. You know, you could have just got lost in translation somewhere. Yeah, well, one would hope so. Yeah. Well, it's certain the charity could use it. It's not like you're using yeah. it for personal gain. Well, no, that's the thing. Nothing. It's been, you know, I mean, yeah, the experience has been priceless, but, you know, financially, it's not been very financial gain at all. Well, you're down on the deal by a long margin, yeah. right? All yeah. that travel. Yeah. How many, do you work out how many miles you? Uh, I think travel. it's like about 230,000 kilometres. That's incredible. Nine Holy. flights. You're amazing. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> well, nine flights, but I think it was like 26 flights with connections. So what is it like completing that and getting back to reality, back to the desk job? Well, it's supposed to have been amazing, but because nothing was given for it. Yeah, it's kind of... I mean, it's, it's honestly, it's the most depressing thing ever. You know? You go through, you win. Right. Well, you win something like that. Yeah, you want some kind of... I mean, you come home and everyone's saying, are you the toughest mother in the world? And I'm like, well, yes and no. Well, what did they call the... Before you took it on, when you subscribed to their terms and conditions, yeah. what, uh, what did you call the... Hey, well, oh, yeah, so the I? three races I mentioned combined are called the Holy Grail. The Holy Grail. Yeah, so if you race one of each, you win that trophy. So I raced 15 of the tougher... <laughs> Seven of the toughest and the, and the world's toughest. And no trophy? No, no. Not even a mention? Not even a mention. You know. Oh. So, and like I say, coming home to tell everyone, yeah, I won, but I didn't win, is, is the worst thing. You know, every time walking down the street, people are like, oh, so you're the toughest in the world, are you? I'm like, yeah, but no. Well, uh, I think in my eyes, you're about as tough as it gets, Charlie. <laughs> Thanks. So, you've been back to the gym, or you've just been no, doing nothing? Is, no, I, I got back and I've been ill, just because, you know, it's quite an intense race. So this is the first run I've had in, like, three weeks. Well, thanks weeks. for coming out. I appreciate oh, it. Yeah, pleasure. Makes my morning a little less foggy and damp. Yeah. Feels a lot harder to run than a normal run, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I've got to run with this stupid thing in my head. We're nearly there. So, so how often are you running? I'm a, well, well, sorry, every day, but I mean... Yeah, and my you distances aren't very great. Yeah. They're uh, no more than three miles. In about averaging about 3.2, I think. That's good. Not very fast, occasionally. Hey, but it adds up. Oh, it adds up. Uh, <laughs> I wish I'd saved 10 quid a day while I've been doing this. <laughs> yeah. I'd be able to 
Nearly 30 grand. Uh, you've got an impressive looking Strava account, I bet. <laughs> For some reason I've got two Strava accounts, I don't know why that is. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's not about anybody else noticing, it's about yeah. doing it myself. But it's nice to be able to share some of these runs with people. Yeah. And uh, I hope we get some people donating yeah, I mean, to like the charity, it's a worthy cause. I'd be hugely grateful. Right, well, thanks Charlie, that was a good run as ever. Thanks very much. Appreciate you coming. Great. Good luck with the uh, ongoing discussions with the South Motor Company, I'm sure they'll do the right thing. Yeah, I mean that's everything, they're a good company, I thought. I've read a lot about them, they seem to be an extremely good company. Mm. I'm surprised this has got caught up in the the machinery somewhere. Yeah, I mean they they have said that they will try and source something, but how long do you wait? (laughs) Well, indeed. And uh, good luck for the training this year, and uh, we'll Thank go you. out for a run again. Maybe I won't carry this stupid thing. Yeah. <laughs> All right, take it easy. Yeah, thanks, thanks John. Very-